Welcome everyone to the uh, webinar today. Um, from the STS side today, we have myself and Catherine um, Holyfield and Sydney Clinton. And from our core group side, we have uh, Katie and Ruth. So thank you guys for joining me today. Um, I don't have a lot of information from the STS perspective, but I'll give our STS updates and then I'll turn things over to Ruth for her, her portion of today's uh, webinar. And then as usual, we will finish things up with Q&A. Um, please uh, be sure to submit those questions via the Q&A function. Um, the raised hand um, function is enabled, so if you'd like to just raise your hand and unmute yourself, you're happy to ask, um, answer, ask your question um, that way, so just let us know. Um, just make sure that your microphone is enabled um, from your end. All right, so let's go ahead and kick things off with our STS updates. Um, Last month, you all should have gotten an email from STS indicating um, or updating you all on our new support plan. Um, IQVIA um, Tier 1 support is no longer going to be handled by IQVIA. We are now handling that in-house here at STS. So this is across all three databases, so for adult cardiac, congenital, and genital thoracic. Um, so if you have questions regarding your participant-specific your reports, your feedback reports, your IQVIA dashboard, your risk-adjusted, your um, unadjusted dashboard, you have issues with your IQVIA login, please email us at stsdb at underscore helpdesk at sts.org. Of course, obviously, this is taking um, place from the GTSD um, tech support at IQVIA.com and the IQVIA tech support. So all um, questions coming in for tech support will come in directly to the STS help desk. Um, they will be forwarded along to either myself to answer or to, um, we will escalate them internally to tier two at IQVIA for um, additional support. So again, just remember all of your report related questions, IQVIA dashboard questions, um, IQVIA access questions should go to stsdb underscore helpdesk at sts.org. For questions regarding our contact updates, if you have general questions, you have questions regarding your contracts, those should still continue to go to stsdb at sts.org. And um, no changes in the clinical question sub um, submission process, you would still continue to submit your clinical questions via the clinical question um, request form out on the STS website. Um, when you do submit um, those questions, uh, that form, just please ensure that you are selecting the correct version, um, the correct data version, and that the correct database are selected. Because based on those choices, those um, your questions are filtered to certain mailboxes within the STS FAQ mailbox that Ruth handles. So again, just ensure that you, have, you select the correct data version and database for um, your clinical questions. <coughs> Can I add one thing here, Leanne? Sure. Um, if you have a question about a difference between uh, 521 and a previous version, if you could submit that to the 521 database, that would be exceptionally helpful. I know that it sort of overlaps two versions and you might not know which one to put it in. Please put it in the most recent version. It's, um, I would appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you, Ruth. All right. Um, additional STS updates. Um, as you guys are aware, the spring 23 harvest is underway, and that harvest does include surgery dates of January 1, 2020 through December 31st of 2022. The harvest is scheduled to close on March the 3rd at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. So please get those um, <clears throat> harvest submission files in no later than uh, March the 3rd at 11.59 p.m. Eastern highly encourage you to get those in um, prior to that March 3rd deadline. The last day to opt out of the harvest is March the 7th. Um, also, we do have our GTSD public reporting update. We do have some excellent news thanks to the hard work of Sydney Clinton and um, Jane Hahn on the um, Sydney is on the call. Um, the STS public reporting website for GTSD has been updated with results from the fall 22 harvest. Um, that does include OR dates of July 1, 2019 through June 30th of 2022. There is an official email communication that is set to go out to all sites um, 
this week. Um, if you have any questions related to public reporting, please reach out to Sydney and her team at publicreporting at sts.org. So again, that official communication announcing the data refresh to the GTSD public reporting website is set to go out, I believe, by the end of this week. Also, um, I just wanted to give a friendly reminder for um, you all to check out the monthly notifications um, within the um, IQVIA library. Um, just a reminder, um, I just want to post this here. Actually, the monthly notifications um, within the notifications tab. Just a friendly reminder, um, just encourage you to check these out periodically, at least monthly. Um, IQVIA does update, um, provide information on release notes of things that have been corrected within the platform, um, enhancements that may have been released within the platform. Um, IQVIA will no longer be joining these calls with us. So um, I do encourage you, I'll provide updates um, from the IQVIA perspective um, on the calls, but um, I also do encourage you to check out the, the release notes um, regarding um, since December. Um, you can find some important information here on things that have been updated within the platform. Um, I'll go over the last, those last two. Um, of course, the um, a couple of the updates in the risk adjusted dashboard report, the print report button has been updated um, to dis only display once the user ha um, has loaded completely and ready to export. Um, MVR logic has been updated. I'm not going to read through all of these. You guys can read through um, in case um, form configuration, lung cancer tab displayed an incorrect label for all nodal stations is in two, and these were this label was updated and corrected within the platform. Additional important release notes. Um, for 2023 of for January, I'm sorry, December 23, 2022, um, the risk adjusted report um, issues were resolved. There were two issues um, for the number of operations does not match the participant dashboard results. This issue was corrected and released in the um, 1223 release. Also, there was another issue that was um, resolved that was brought to us by a data manager regarding the risk adjusted report, the number of operations and mortality, um, the discharge and operative mortality percentages displayed incorrect values for the last 12 month periods for the participant and the STS aggregate. So um, this issue was regarding in the operational reports under the risk adjusted dashboard report. Just wanted to show you what is what was resolved and what was corrected here. Sorry, it's going to take a second. And this um, report is under the other reports tab on the main page. And my internet is slow. There we go. So this is under the number of oper this specific fix was under the number of operations and mortality and i'll be able to click on the report here as soon as the participant id pops up sorry my internet is super slow today So this was regarding um, the discharge mortality. So the mortality percentage that we're, that was showing here, the calculation was incorrect. The number of mortalities and the number of eligible, the numerator and denominators were correct in the report. It was just regarding the, the percentage, the calculation was incorrect. Um, so that was the issue that was resolved here for this report. So again, I just, um, and when you log in, I, again, I just encourage you to check the notifications tab to, to get an update on the, um, current updates within the platform and the release notes within IQVIA. Um, also, the February training manual and FAQ summary are um, with marketing and will be posted by the end of this week. Um, Gabby is out today, so she is, um, I expect her, she will have those um, documents updated um, by tomorrow, um, but they will definitely be posted by the end of this week. Um, before I turn everything over to Ruth, did you have anything you wanted to add, Ruth, in addition to regarding the training manual? Sure. So I think there were some questions regarding the training manual that was posted. So there was some delay for um, 
as we tried to sort through some process on the back end, I guess is the best summary. So the November and December um, updates were posted simultaneously as a January update, which just created general confusion. There are no January updates that will be posted. Um, so when February posts, you'll see February updates um, and that will stand. The November and December updates go into effect in November or December as listed in the training manual that was posted um, at the beginning of January. And I apologize for the confusion. If you have any additional questions on that, I'm happy to take them in the Q&A and we can talk through them together. Or if you'd prefer, you can email me and or Leanne individually offline. And I guess I will pause there to see if there are any questions on that or any other things. Um, there's one question, Leah, maybe before we move on, mm -hmm. um, someone used stsdb at sts.org and got an email message that it's not a valid email address. Is that correct? No, stsdb at sts.org is a valid email. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, stsdb is a valid email. If you have any issues, um, just email me directly. I'll put my email in the, in the chat box but that should be, that is a valid email. Um, and then the question about reporting, Leanne, I'll give you time to read through that while I do my um, okay. presentation. Maybe we'll circle back to that one. Does that sound yeah, good? Yeah, we'll circle back. Yep, we'll circle okay. back to that one, yep. Sounds good. Okay, let's hop into these updates. Um, so these are the some of the February training manual updates. Sequence 640 diabetes therapy, you'll code none. If the patient is prescribed medication for diabetic control but is not taking it, whether it's because they can't afford it or psychosocial or it's not really clinically required at this point in time, you would code um, none unless the patient is actively transitioned to like a diet, diet controlled diabetes plan, in which case you could code diet only if that's true. Um, a couple of clarifications on 740 and 750, and I think um, sort of just cleaning up our communication to you on what the text in blue means that resides in the training manual. So for sequence 740, it says that the field is required for record inclusion. If it's missing data, the entire record gets excluded from analysis. That does not mean that if you code no, that your case, whether that be a lung case or an esophageal case, would get excluded from analysis. It means that if you leave it blank, and do not answer yes or no, then your case would be excluded. So as long as you're answering yes or no here, um, you should be okay with the caveat of the next slide, which is sequence 750. If you code yes to 740, but then same scenario, leave 750 blank because now you've said yes to the parent field. So 750 will open. You have to answer it in order for your case to be included in analysis. Um, if you code no to 740, then 750 isn't even going to open. And again, your case will be included. 790, history of substance abuse. We line the, uh, the alcohol um, abuse sequence up with uh, illicit drug use. So you'll capture alcohol abuse in 790 for patients that have a history of alcohol abuse that are currently taking antabuse under clinician direction as part of their treatment for their alcohol abuse. So patients actively managing their abuse with treatment. Sequence 840, major psychiatric disorder. You cannot code yes. So do not code yes to 840 based only on a medication prescribed. A diagnosis is required. The rationale for that is there are sometimes uh, medications that are used for things like depression, anxiety that are used for other indications. And so you can't infer a major psychiatric, that the patient has a major psychiatric disorder based only on a medication list. Sequence 1470 procedure. I've gotten so many questions about ion navigational bronchoscopy. Um, you would capture that as bronchoscopy navigational. It's not captured as robotic, even though um, it's sold by Intuit, which is the company that, that does a lot of robotic. Um, they, they sell robots for like robotic uh, lobectomy, et cetera. Um, it's not considered a robotic procedure for sequence 1400. One of the other sort of adjacent um, updates to this that will actually appear in the March training manual is uh, sometimes you'll see in these uh, notes for the ion navigational bronchoscopy, the utilization of the term EBIS um, for biopsy of a peripheral nodule, which is really, really confusing. Um, EBIS in that instance would not be captured as mediastinal staging because they're not staging the mediastinum. They've completely ignored the mediastinum. They're just using in 
quote unquote EBIS scope as part of a, a peripheral review. Um, and that update will, will be added in March. Sequence 1480, primary procedure, endoscopic submucosal dissection for esophageal cancer is not captured as an esophageal cancer resection. It's not required for entry into the registry. You're welcome to enter it if you enter all cases, but certainly not required. Um, and you can see sort of in the picture there, the endoscopic submucosal dissections, really them just sort of picking up a like a very shallow um, piece of tissue and ligating it and removing it. So much different than a true esophagectomy. Sequence 1560, hiatal hernia, diaphragmatic hernia, or GERD. The name of the sequence is very misleading. The intent is really only to capture hiatal or parasophageal hernia repairs. Um, I cannot pronounce the names of these uh, individuals who created these procedures ever. I think it's... <laughs> Yeah, Where's I got nothing for you. you. <laughs> Katie, you throw a girl bone. Um, I think, yeah, I'm not even going to try it. But you can see in the blue and in the green on the picture, neither of those procedures are considered hadal hernia repairs, and you do not need to include them um, in the optional hadal hernia module. Um, you should not include them in the optional hadal hernia model. They're not hadal hernia repairs. Sequence 2080, lung cancer histology grade. Um, I've gotten lots of questions related specifically to invasive mucinous adenocarcinomas is where this tends to be popping up a lot lately. Um, the question is what grade should be entered if, if the pathologist says that this lung cancer tumor type does not have a grade, you'll choose unknown, not reported, even though it is very appropriate that your pathologists are not grading these um, invasive mucinous adenocarcinomas. Um, we don't want you to leave it blank. Choose unknown, not recorded. Oh, this one was going to be a question, but um, that's all right. It's okay. I um, forgot to tell you that. Would you capture <laughs> a bedside pigtail or chest tube insertion in sequence 3670? The correct answer is no. So sequence 3670 is not intended to capture bedside procedures with the exception of a very few instances, both of which are outlined in the um, training manual. This one was a great catch from a data manager. Get the pun there, it's a nice, a good <laughs> well done. catch. Well done. Yeah, I know, I do what I can to keep it lively. So sequence <laughs> 3810, initial event support greater than 48 hours. In the definition of this sequence, it incorrectly says, if the patient is reintubated, select the post-operative event reintubation, but reintubation is in a selectable post-operative event. So you would choose respiratory failure, which is sequence 3760 um, for reintubations, if it meets the criteria for 3760, which is defined in the training manual. And when we come out with the next version, we'll try and um, get the definition on this one corrected. So thank you to the data manager who so closely read her training manual. Uh, sequence 4200, patient is still in the hospital. So this sequence only applies to the index admission. So if your patient has been readmitted, then by definition, you're going to code no to sequence 4200 because they, they have left the hospital. Um, they could still be in the hospital from their readmission. It's irrelevant because it only applies to that index admission. And I think that is the end of my updates. Yep. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Um, just real quick, again, my contact information is here for anyone that needs to get in touch with me. Um, if you're not sure who or which email address to send your question to, please feel free to email me directly and I can um, point you into the right direction. Happy to assist in any way. Again, just a reminder that um, database operational questions regarding your contracts, um, uh, contact updates, um, anything invoice related, any type of general, just a general database um, operational question should go to stsdb at sts.org. And um, the tech support email address is here. So um, you would no longer, again, just a reminder, you're no longer reaching out to IQ via tech support. You should reach out to stsdb underscore helpdesk at sts.org.
Um, our next uh, upcoming webinars for GTSD, our next user group call is scheduled for February 22nd um, at 2.30 Central Time, and our next monthly webinar is March the 8th at 1.30 Central. Um, if you all have any ideas, if, there's, if there are specific topics um, that you are struggling with or um, specific case scenarios that you would like to see, please um, email your, um, your ideas to Ruth and myself. Um, we love to make these, uh, we definitely want to make these webinars is useful for you. Um, we want to give you education on um, specific areas where you're struggling. So please um, feel free to reach out to either Ruth or myself and provide us with, um, you know, topics and um, case scenarios that you would like, really like to see. You know, we're happy to bring in surgeon speakers um, if needed. Um, we're happy to have additional data managers um, provide presentations, educational presentations on educational topics. So um, again, please just um, feel free to share your ideas with us. We again, we want to make these um, education webinars um, useful for you all and give you all the education that you that you want and that you need. Um, so with that, we're going to turn things over to questions. Looks like we do have um, some few, a few questions coming in. Um, so let, let's go ahead and tackle these, Ruth. Um, did you want to read through them or do you want sure, me to? It's yeah. up to it doesn't matter, whichever. So uh, the question is, what if you answer yes to PFTs, but you only have the FEV1 and the patient couldn't complete the rest of the testing? So there's no DLCO. I left the DLCO, DLCO blank, but based on the initial slides, this case would not be included. How can I fix this? Um, I think that if, so DLCO is not a required field. Right. So you can leave DLCO blank and your case will still be included. And I know sometimes patients will have like only spirometry that happens actually fairly often. Um, and so DLCO is left blank in those instances as well. And, and you'll again, be fine. Um, right. Yes. And yeah. I can show you how you know that. Yep. So the, um, the required fields are the ones that are underlined and in blue. So um, FEV1 predicted is one of the is the required field and as well as the PFT performed. But um, like, as Bruce said, if you don't have the DLCO that that criteria there, just not having the DLCO would not keep your case from being excluded. Um, the next question in the lecture regarding audits at AQM by Dr. Fernandez, mm -hmm. he mentioned orders for palliative care would be considered operative mortality. Is this going to be captured moving forward? Um, I think, and Lee, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think what we're capturing actually is not orders for palliative care, but rather discharges to hospice. Correct. Um, and I think that the STS is very committed to the concept of encouraging palliative care as appropriate. Um, not that they're discharge, d discouraging discharge as a hospice, but um, they're not lumped together. Correct. So really it's the discharge as a hospice that are being counted as operative mortality. Right. Yep. It's um, the MTDC stat 4220. And if you um, select discharge to hospice. Um, it looks like we have a data manager who is looking to connect with another data manager. Oh. Um, and so her email address is in the q and I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if um, I can share it with everybody, but. Um, I'm going to put her email here, Catherine Ross at prismahealth.org. And Catherine, I know we do have a mentor-mentee program here at STS, and um, we are working, our STS staff is working um, ways to um, to get more mentors. I think right now we have more mentees than we have mentors. So we're um, working the way to get more <laughs> mentors um, within the program. So if you haven't submitted a request for that, please feel free to submit one. Um, and I, you can just reach out to me directly and I can point you in that direction. Um, also, Katie, um, may say she, she may reach out to you as well. A follow-up question on the discharge to hospice. So if a patient is discharged to hospice but doesn't expire for eight weeks, this is considered mortality? Yes. And that is um, that has gone back to... Um, the task force for GTSD, and I think that went back even to a level above that, and the mm -hmm. decision was made to count discharges of hospice as a mortality, regardless of how many days go by before the patient expires. The rationale behind that is that for elective Q 
curative intent lung and esophageal cancer resections for um, something to change to the extent that the patient becomes discharged to hospice would not be expected. Um, and so they felt that it was reasonable to capture those as mortalities. Um, from my own personal experience, the majority of my discharges to hospice were patients that were getting things like Plurex, et cetera. And at my institution, we don't capture those cases anymore. Um, so really just think about that in the context of really only your analyzed procedures, which should be curative intent, lung and esophageal cancer resections. Excellent. Thanks for it. Um, Okay, what is the recommendation for opting out of harvest with low case numbers? Um, Angie, if you want to um, give me, shoot me an um, email and, and I'm happy to talk to you um, about that, but um, yeah, just shoot me an email and, and, and let's talk through your specific um, scenario and let me get more information about what's um, happening at your site. Happy to chat, Angie. Um, but Amanda said, are we required to put this for all abstraction cases? Yes, so you do put discharge status in for all abstraction cases, but um, that data is really for your own internal use. So if you would pull your, like let's say you wanna pull your Plurex patient cohort, you could see if the majority of them were being discharged to hospice and that might be useful information for you and your institution. There's no, um, I guess there's no penalty for having it be counted as a mortality in that context if you're entering cases that aren't being analyzed. I don't know, Katie, is there a way that you can think to put additional clarity around it? Say, what's the question again, specifically? Um, so we're still working through the issue of uh, being discharged to hospice is being counted for a mortality. And I think the issue really is for cases, for sites that abstract all cases, is that really equitable? Um, and I, I guess the data isn't used external to your institution at that point, and so it sort of just is what it is. So are they wanting to sub not submit, like how do they get around submitting or not submitting the case that they're entering in? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess you could not submit the cases if you didn't want to. Yeah, truly You're yeah I mean I think it yeah I think if it's not one of the required cases um mm -hmm. or you're not doing the op one of the optional modules then um I mean me personally when I collect cases that fall outside of that because I do collect some um I just leave our participant ID blank um on my data collection or on my um data entry so then when I create my harvest file, that case is not included because when I create my harvest file, it pulls all cases based on participant ID. So that's how I do it. I don't know if that's um, how it is with every vendor, though. I don't know if you are allowed to leave your participant ID field blank. But if you are, then that would be one way to be able to capture your cases and use the information internally, but exclude um, non-required cases from your harvest file. All right. Thanks, Katie. Um, thanks, Katie. All right. If a patient has a right upper lobe for a primary lung cancer, then has a left upper lobe for another primary lung cancer a year later, is this considered a reoperation sequence 580? Um, you have to meet both criteria for sequence 580. So you are in the same anatomic space, um, the thoracic cavity, the same portion of the thoracic cavity. Um, there would have to be documented adhesions or some sort of documentation that it increased the difficulty or complexity of the current um, left upper lobectomy in your scenario. So potentially it would be captured in 580. I can't um, answer it definitively without knowing whether or not the surgeons documented um, increased difficulty. But you are in the same pleural cavity space, yes. All right. Um, are you able to answer Joseph's question or would you like that one to be submitted to the 
675. Um, I have a question regarding the definition of same disease and unrelated disease. I have a patient who had a metastatic thymoma. They got chemo and radiation. However, the cancer spread to the lungs and pleural cavity. The patient underwent lung resection, which is what I am abstracting. Would this be the same disease or is it unrelated? Um, it would be the same disease if the lung was resected for the metastatic thymoma, which is what it sounds like. Um, if you were resecting the lung for lung cancer, it would not be the same disease, but I don't think that's what you're talking about. I think you're talking about METs. So yes, it's the same disease. Um, would this be considered for STS submission or would not be considered as metastasized from the thymoma? Right. So you would not need that. You don't have to enter that case. You could leave that case out because it's, um, essentially a metastectomy, um, for, of the lung, from, of the lung, I guess, for metastatic disease. So it's not a lung cancer resection. It's not a thymectomy for thymoma. Um, so you wouldn't even hit the criteria for the optional module for thymoma. The left and right pleural cavities are not connected though. Um, To some yeah, extent, I, yes. I mean, you can violate the opposite plural cavity. It depends on exactly how the procedure was performed, which is why you have to have, you have to meet the second criteria, which is that the prior surgery increased the difficulty of the current case in order for it to count as a reoperation. So if you're doing a left upper lobe and previously they did a right upper lobe and there are, there are no adhesions, nothing difficult about this case, then you'll, you'll answer no. So I think it's fine. It's still you're in the pleural cavity. I think it's, it's okay to follow the direction of the training manual. And I think you'll end up in the right place. Katie, did you have anything to add? Sorry. No, I just, you okay. know, it, no, go ahead. No. <laughs> um, Dawn, of your question regarding direct data entry and, and only, so I honestly, I'm not familiar. I think we'd have to talk to IQVIA. I'm not as familiar with the direct data entry. Um, so I don't know how to answer that question specifically. If you could shoot me an email. Um, and then we could talk about that offline because I'm not exactly sure how you would do that with the direct data entry platform. Um, we Christine. always entered optional cases and now we will not be entering them any longer. Is there someone we need to inform? No, no. It'll just be reflected in the reports that are in the IQVIA platform. You'll see your <laughs> volumes drop off. Let's see. Um, and then, okay, back to the dot, the direct data entry. I don't do direct data entry, so I yeah uh, i can i, know, I can you, take this i know okay. that dawn and i dawn and i chatted about this a little bit okay. before um i think her main concern is whether or not these post-op events and dawn you can speak up or type in if i'm mis um quoting or saying this wrong but i think she's concerned that the complications will get assigned making sure that they don't get assigned to both um because the patient went in for the one lobectomy and then she went back um, for a second lobectomy for the right middle lobe. And so typically how it's always worked is the post-op events, wh whether you have, whether you put your post-op events mm -hmm. all on the first procedure or on the subsequent procedures, if you have post-op events that partic that might happen after the second case, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter. It all gets assigned to your first case. So right. all of your post-op events would get assigned to your first right upper lobectomy. Right. Um, that your second lobectomy, no, the only thing I don't know is if that other lobectomy, does it show up in the legacy reports at all as a, as a procedure? Um, I think, but I don't know, but none of the post-op events should be assigned to it. And it's not a required case since mm -hmm. obviously you're not, they're not going back for another lung cancer resection. It's just for the post-op event, which I know that's part of why you're asking is because you're collecting that second case. Yeah. The legacy um, report, yeah. Yeah. But the, the post-op events get always assigned to that first case mm -hmm. as well as a, the death right okay 
I will have to check with Ikevia. Um, I'm not as I, I'm just not sure. So and, and Donna, that you sent me that via email. So um, let me follow up with that um, with Ikevia. Um, okay, Ruth, I don't know if you're able to answer any of the. I am tabbing questions. through the training manual to sequence 1830. So um, if a patient has primary lung cancer with possible calvarial mets, but not proven by biopsy prior to OR, how do we capture this under clinical staging sequence 1830? It was never proven by biopsy after surgery as well. Um, your surgeon needs to help you um, answer that question. Uh, they you know, we'll either choose to treat that lesion or not. So at some point, somebody's going to have to decide whether they think that's a, a met or it's it's not a met. Um, so hopefully either your oncologist or your surgeon have documented that somewhere. Um, but if you don't have access to the oncology or surgery uh, note that you need or you can't find it, I would, I would email your surgeon and ask them um, whether they want you to answer how they want you to enter, answer clinical M stage. Um, if a surgeon performs wedge resection times three for diagnostic purposes, what is the best way to capture wedge number two and number three? Um, I don't enter I, these anymore, Katie. I think you just put it yeah, in once, right? You just put it, the yeah, the diagnostic ones, you only put in once. It If you look at, I'm pretty sure if you look at the actual procedure, the way it's listed, it's um, it can be just one or plural. So, it um, you know, multiple wedges or one. If you're using the diagnostic code, you only have to enter it once. Yes, it is. It says like biopsy and then in parentheses, it says S, so plural. Yeah, I'm also Thanks, for Katie. It. Thank you, Katie. Sequence 610, history of vascular disease with a patient who has an AVM and an AVF meet criteria for having major vascular disease. Um, let me look and see. I feel like we've talked about this one before, but maybe it's not here. Um. Um, Beth, if you haven't submitted that one to the FAQ mailbox, can you send it, send it in? Sorry. We're not having that one on the fly. Yeah. Yep. We can discuss that in our core group call. Perfect. All right. Um, again, just a reminder, I'm not seeing any additional questions. The next webinar, this, the user group call for uh, February 22nd, right prior to the um, close of the spring 23 harvest. Um, that call will be at 2.30 Central. And then our monthly webinar is scheduled for March 8th at 1.30 Central. So again, if you have ideas or anything you really um, feel like you would like to have some education on, please give those ideas to Ruth and myself. And we are happy to work on that and get those, um, get that monthly education um, tailored to your specific needs or what you guys feel like you need more education on. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions come in. So... Um, you're welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, would you expect to? Okay. Um, Ruth, they're just asking when um, you're going to get the responses out for the FAQs. I know you're working on them. Sure. Yep. Yep. It is a work in progress. She is um, doing that. Oh, no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mary. We appreciate all of you guys. All right, everyone. So thank you so much for joining today. Again, if you have any questions, I'm not sure who to contact, please reach out to me directly and I can get you in touch with the appropriate um, staff. So um, with that, thank you, Ruth, Katie, Sydney, Catherine. Um, I appreciate you guys, Ruth. Thanks so much. Um, if you guys need anything, please feel free to reach out to me um, with that. I hope you guys have a great rest of the week and um, thank you all. We're here to help please reach out. Thanks everyone. I hope you have a great week.